In today's episode, we go over some of the most deadly bear attacks covered on the channel so far. From Arctic explorers targeted by a man-eating polar bear to a murderous brown bear who killed nine people over the course of six days. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. These are some of the most deadly bear attacks you'll ever hear. Welcome to Final Affliction. In the late 1500s, Dutch explorer Willem Barents set out on three expeditions to the frozen north. His aim was to find a northeast polar passage connecting Europe to China. He left his native home of Holland and traveled northwards over Scandinavia and then east to the Barents Sea, named after him. It would open a valuable trade route, saving time shipping cargo between the two destinations. But his expeditions were fraught with challenges and obstacles, not least of all, the inhospitable environment of the Arctic. Twice, Willem had to turn their boat back around and head for home when they reached dead ends. But on the third expedition, they managed to carve their way further along the proposed route, until disaster struck. On September 11, 1596, Willem and his crew were trapped by pack ice surrounding the boat. They couldn't go forwards, and they couldn't go back. They were stuck, frozen on the ice sheets drifting around the sea. They would have to endure a winter in one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. They decided to build a cabin on the ice, a place where they could stay during the winter. Conditions were brutal in the Arctic. For four months over the winter, the sun doesn't rise above the horizon. The constant dusk-like light makes it difficult to distinguish night from day. Equally, the cold is almost unbearable. It averages negative 30 degrees Celsius, negative 22 Fahrenheit, a bone-chilling cold that is inescapable. As their supplies dwindled, they were forced to venture further to find driftwood to keep fires going. They salvaged what they could from the boat and trapped and ate Arctic foxes to preserve their food supply. If being trapped in an ice sheet in the ocean isn't scary enough, they were plagued by polar bears. They were very curious. Some climbed onto their boat, some scratched at their hut trying to find a way in. The polar bears were a constant fear for everyone. Their first sighting of one of those impressive animals made an impression on the crew. They tried to capture it so they could take it back to Holland to show people. They lassoed the bear, but it became apparent that handling a full-grown polar bear on a confined ship was a death wish. In the end, they killed it and planned to take the pelt back home. The crew found it difficult to kill the polar bears. Shooting them often only maimed the animals and made them more dangerous. It seemed like pain fueled the animals' rage. But despite them being hard to kill, they managed to take some of them down and use their fat to power their lanterns, providing light in an otherwise dark land. The meat they were able to cut from the bears was enough to last the entire winter, and it was a lot better tasting than the Arctic foxes. However, on one occasion they ate the polar bear's liver, which almost killed the entire crew. A well-known fact now, but unknown to the men at the time, was that polar bear liver has such a high level of vitamin A that eating it can be fatal. Symptoms of polar bear liver poisoning depend on the amount of liver consumed, but usually include weakness, vomiting, diarrhea, drowsiness, headaches, hair loss, bone pain, peeling skin, and blurred vision. If someone eats too much polar bear liver, symptoms include full body skin loss, hemorrhaging, coma, and death. Scurvy was also a constant battle for the men. Their bodies were unwashed and the stench inside the hut enticed the polar bears even more. A small group left the hut and went to search for driftwood. Nothing grew in the frozen land. There were no trees or shrubs, no vegetation that they could burn to keep their fire going, to keep them warm and to cook on. Instead, they had to scavenge from their boat and from what the sea brought them. They hiked for miles, carrying with them a sled that they could load up. It was hard work trudging through the ice and snow. They were ill-prepared for the conditions. They hadn't anticipated having to leave their ship. They had no snowshoes and no warm winter clothing. 
As they walked closer to the open sea, the ice became thinner. It became more and more broken up. Sometimes the men had to step from one floating island of ice to the next. It was dangerous. One bad move, one slip, and they would fall into the water. Hypothermia would set in within seconds. They wouldn't stand a chance. But there were worse dangers out there than hypothermia. Polar bears continued to be on the prowl. The men knew the dangers they faced. They saw how aggressive the bears could be and how powerful they were. Their initial awe of the animals had long since worn off. Now they were terrified by their existence. As they stepped onto a floating island of ice, something caught their eyes. In the distance, something moved, white against white. It was a polar bear, and it was interested in them. As it walked, the men could see its characteristic lumbering gait, the way its head swung gently from side to side as it ambled towards them. The men raised their guns, but they knew from experience that it was very difficult to kill a polar bear. Unless it was a direct shot into its skull, the bullet would only injure it, causing it to become more aggressive. At that time, the polar bears were curious of people. They hadn't yet learnt to fear them, and as a predator that is constantly on the lookout for an opportunistic meal, it was dangerous. They had lived as the apex predators of the Arctic for centuries. They knew no different. The bear continued to close the gap between them. It didn't run, it didn't charge, but it made steady progress. When it was just 20 feet away, it stopped and raised its head skywards, sniffing the air. The men hoped it would turn back. They hoped it would see the group of them as a threat and turn away. But without warning, the polar bear went from a complete standstill to a full-on charge in a millisecond. Reaching speeds of up to 25 miles per hour, polar bears can easily outrun a human. It closed the gap between them in seconds. The men leapt across to another floating island of ice. When the bear reached the edge of the ice, it slipped into the water and disappeared from sight. The men huddled together looking over the edge into the icy water. Where had the bear gone? Maybe it had given up. Maybe it had swum underneath them and continued swimming. But just then, to their horror, the polar bear popped up beside the ice. Its fur slicked down with the water, its enormous head peering over the top of the iceberg. Then, with one huge paw, it swiped at the men. It caught one of them with its 3.5-inch, 9-centimeter-long claws and dragged him kicking and screaming into the water. The other men fired their guns, but in the commotion and the chaos, they missed. They then watched as the bear dragged their companion out of the water and onto the nearby ice. They could see the man was still alive. He was struggling to breathe, coughing and spluttering as the bear bit down on his skull. They heard the crack of bone, the crunch from the bear's powerful jaws. Then their friend fell silent. The men were trapped on the island of ice. They endured the torture of having to watch their friend being devoured by the bear, blood spilling onto the pristine white snow. The bear lifted its head. Its muzzle had turned red as it turned to look at the rest of the crew. Were they going to be next? They were in a conundrum. Should they stay still, waiting for the bear to finish its meal and leave? Or should they make a break for it whilst the bear was distracted? Every time they tried to move, the bear stopped eating and looked up. It may be more aggressive now that it was protecting its kill. No one knew what to do. Very slowly, the men inched away. They never took their eyes off the bear as they crept back towards the relative safety of their hut and fellow crewmates. When they made it back to the hut, shaken and traumatized, they crawled inside and delivered the devastating news to the rest of the crew. That night, they had to endure the terrifying sounds of a polar bear scratching at the roof of the hut, trying to break through, trying to catch its next meal. They were terrified the door would burst down at any moment and they'd be the next to get eaten alive. How long could they endure this torture? It would be 10 months before the men could depart the frozen Arctic. By the following June, the sea ice had melted enough for them to begin their journey home. They had spent almost a year in the grueling Arctic conditions. Their ship was irreparable, but they managed to sail two smaller boats southwards back towards Holland.
They made it to Kola Bay, just north of Scandinavia, hungry and weak, still in the same clothes they had been in ten months earlier. They boarded a Dutch ship which sailed them down to Holland, but Willem didn't make it. He died on the journey. His final expedition had come to a sad end. Of the seventeen crew to set out on the venture, only twelve made it home to their families, many of them having witnessed one of the worst polar bear attacks of all time, a polar bear dragging their friend into the ocean and onto a sheet of ice, eating him alive as he slowly succumbed to his final affliction. On May 14, 1978, four boys between the ages of 12 and 18 had gone out for a relaxing day of fishing in the Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario, Canada. 18-year-old Richard Rindress and his younger brother William had invited 12-year-old George Halfkenny along with his 14-year-old brother Mark to practice fishing in the Radiant Lake in northeastern Ontario. It was a calm lake surrounded by pristine wilderness and thick forests. The water hosted trout, bass, and a variety of smallmouth fish. The wider park had several species of mammals including moose, deer, and beavers, but among the trees lurked a predator. The famed black bear was known to inhabit the deeper forest, but seldom had encounters with humans. The large furry mammal could weigh over 450 pounds 200 kilograms, and stand taller than an average human on two feet. They weren't known to be aggressive unless provoked, and usually kept to themselves deep among the forest wildlife. It was early summer in Canada, and the warm heat of the sun had created an ideal fishing escape among the trees. The fish were plentiful. The boys parked their car near the radiant lake and ventured off for catch. It was a serene experience for the young boys as the summer sun heated the once frozen trees and lakes, making hungry fish resurface and take the baits. The entire day went by, and the boys were ecstatic with their catch. A few hours later, the sky started turning blue as sunlight faded and evening set in. Unknown to them, an apex predator's eyes had been locked on them from among the dense trees. A hungry black bear had ventured too close near the lake where the boys had been fishing. The dark forest, aided by the dimming sunlight, helped the black bear camouflage itself in the background. The ambush predator stalked the boys along the trees and was aided by the silent crunch of the cold, wet leaves that littered the forest floor. As dark set in, the four boys headed back to their car to sort out their catch before leaving. Parked a few hundred meters from the lake, the young boys were preparing to drive away. George Halfkenny, tempted by the good catch throughout the day, decided to give it one more try before the sky went completely dark. He decided to walk to the lake alone after telling the other boys he would be back in a few minutes and cast his hook one last time into the clear waters, hoping to catch a big one to take home. But by this time, 12-year-old George Halfkenny had become an object of interest for the giant black bear lying in wait among the trees. Caught alone and unable to defend himself, George was quietly ambushed from behind by the forest predator. As it stood on two hind legs and slammed its feet onto the young boy's fragile torso, George could only let out a light squeal unheard by any one of his friends before being dragged away by the massive bear. He died a quick death, but his final moments were in terror and pain as the bear towered over the young boy before breaking his neck using its body weight. A few minutes passed and George had still not returned. The boys had been waiting for him and wanted to leave before night set in. They called his name from afar into the dark, empty forest, but there was no response. Something was eerily wrong, and every passing minute made them concerned for George's safety. William and Mark finally decided to walk to the edge of the lake shore and look for George. There was no sign of him, but their cries and calls for their friend were heard by something else. The predatory black bear had been alerted by the sounds and decided to leave George's body in the woods to come back for more, this time for William and Mark. The boys were now worried and trembling from the fear and cold. This is when they made the fatal mistake of going deeper into the trees to look for him. Walking among the bush trail and tight forest, Mark separated from William, trying to find his lost brother. 
The bear appeared from between the trees, and Mark quickly found himself jumped by a mass of black fur. The bear ended his life in a similar fashion, breaking his neck with its body weight before dragging him away into the forest. The little boy could offer little resistance and died a quick death. The area once again fell silent, and William realized something was terribly wrong. His heart started racing, and he let out cries of help, calling on his friend and brother. The bear now had two dead bodies, but was not done with the hunt. William was alone. He was now deep in the predator's area, and hopelessly lost and vulnerable. Sixteen-year-old William was terrified out of his senses and tried running to safety among the confusing maze of forest trees. The giant black bear again started chasing him, stealthily following his voice and scent. A brief chase, and William was ambushed from behind by the black bear in a similar way it had killed Mark and George. The frail young boy was no match for the bear's massive weight, its sharp claws or biting teeth. He succumbed to the attack in a few seconds and became an addition to the pile of dead bodies that the bear had been collecting after dragging them into the forest. 18-year-old Richard Rindress awaited the return of the other three boys and was left puzzled by the sudden silence that befell the scene after their calls for George could no longer be heard. The boys seemed to disappear, one after the other, in an eerie fashion, with no idea of what happened to them. Reluctantly, he walked further a few meters close to the shoreline in hopes of finding a sign of his brother and friends, but to no avail. He noticed only a dropped fishing pole beside the water, surrounded by a thick forest. It was the dark of night, and Richard was too unnerved to dare venture deeper into the woods for fear of meeting a similar fate as the other boys. He hastily ran back to the car to go and find help from local residents and authorities to locate his friends. A search party was organized, and several armed men spread into the forest, trying to find the missing young boys. A few hours later, the bodies of George, Mark, and William were finally found, huddled close to one another. They were still uneaten, but piled together by the bear in a cynical fashion. A few feet away in the bushes, a large black bear was spotted guarding its kill. The boys had all been killed in a similar way, with a quick snap of the neck, with the massive weight of the black bear stomping with its front legs. It was a terrifying sight and left researchers perplexed why the bear had carried out the predatory attack and not consumed any of the bodies of the young boys. It was thought that the bear may have been tempted by the smell of the dead trout that George had been carrying in his pocket, but could not find it. The young boys had planned their fishing trip at the last time they should have, in the new summer heat when the black bears were more likely to come closer out of the forest to search the lakes for fish. The 275-pound black bear was shot dead by the authorities, but the news of the brutal demise of the three young boys sent shockwaves across Canada and devastated their parents and families beyond consolation. No one expected a killer black bear to be roaming the forest, stalking the three young boys and leading them to their terrifying final affliction. Yellowstone National Park is an American national park located in the western United States, largely in the northwest corner of Wyoming and extending into Montana and Idaho. Yellowstone was the first national park in the U.S. and is also widely held to be the first national park in the world. The park is known for its many geothermal features, especially the Old Faithful Geyser, one of its most popular. While it represents many types of biomes, the subalpine forest is the most abundant. It's part of the South Central Rockies forest ecoregion, which spans an area of 3,468 square miles. It comprises of lakes, canyons, rivers, and beautiful mountain ranges. Yellowstone Lake is one of the largest high elevation lakes in North America. It is centered over the Yellowstone Caldera, the largest supervolcano on the continent. It has erupted with tremendous force several times in the last two million years and is overdue to explode again soon. Grizzly bears, wolves, and free-ranging herds of bison and elk live in this park. It's safe to say 
Yellowstone National Park is a dangerous place to be, and with numerous recreational opportunities, including hiking, camping, boating, fishing, and sightseeing attracting nearly 5 million visitors each year, it's no surprise that it's seen its fair share of tragic deaths. On April 15, 2021, Charles Mock, who was 40 years old at the time, set out into the park to do some fishing in the place he loved most, Yellowstone National Park. Charles was always an avid lover of the outdoors, ever since early childhood. But out of all places in the world, he fell in love with Yellowstone. When he turned 30, he moved there permanently, just so he could spend every bit of spare time he had in the park. The overwhelming sense of peace and happiness he experienced in the rugged remoteness of the park was so much that he soon sought out work inside the park. Charles wanted to spend every waking second of the day in Yellowstone and finally got his wish when he landed a job as a tour guide for backcountry adventure. Charles wanted to catch some trout at his favorite fishing spot on the Madison River, deep in the wilderness of Yellowstone. He was aware of the risks and dangers that come with venturing this far into the wild, but had been fishing all week without any problems. It's well known that the presence of grizzly bears is an everlasting threat to the lives of all fishermen, hunters, hikers, campers. Anyone venturing into the wilderness here is advised to carry some form of self-protection, and Charles knew this. He always made sure to keep his pistol and bear spray with him, just in case he ever had to use it. But after a week of fishing, he felt safe enough to leave his pistol at home and only bring with him his bear spray. Charles arrived at the river and began unpacking his equipment from his truck. He gathered his fishing pole, camera, and supplies and began soaking in the peace that he always felt here. He also brought along his tackle box full of other important items and began his half a mile hike down the trail towards the water. As always, he kept a wary eye out during the walk for the variety of dangerous animals in the area. Bison, grizzly bears, and even moose have been involved in attacks on humans in prior years, and that was the last thing Charles wanted to come across alone in the wilderness. He'd had his fair share of bears encounters throughout the years. Charles and his friend Riley had numerous run-ins with grizzlies who had even bluff charged them several times to intimidate them. Luckily, they were always just warnings to scare off the men who, thankfully, were never actually attacked, but a terrifying experience nonetheless. As Charles walked along the riverbank, looking for a good spot to dip his line and snap photos of the beautiful scenery, he unknowingly walked into one of the most dangerous situations he could have found. It was a large moose carcass that looked to be half eaten by a grizzly bear. What Charles failed to realize was that the bear who claimed this food source had already been fighting to defend its food to the point of killing and partially eating another grizzly. It was still enraged and irritated from the fight and watching in the distance. Charles froze as soon as he realized what he was walking towards and quietly scanned the tree line while listening carefully for any signs of the bear. He slowly began backing up the way he came, being careful not to turn his back to the carcass. He knew that if the grizzly was watching, it would be more likely to attack him while his back was turned. All of a sudden, Charles heard a loud woof sound that he recognized as a bear, which sent shivers down his spine. He immediately stopped in his tracks and surveyed the area around him for the upset bear, while simultaneously pulling out his bear spray as a precaution, as he prepared himself mentally for what is typically a very tense standoff. As he searched the brush for the bear, the forest turned eerily silent for a few seconds. Suddenly, the silence was broken by the bear charging toward him. Carl prayed that it was just another bluff charge, Time stood still for Charles as he watched the bear's eyes focusing solely on him as it came rocketing in his direction. The bear closed the last 100 feet of distance with blinding speed as Charles unloaded his bear spray at the grizzly. The orange cloud of bear spray engulfed the bear, but it seemed to have done nothing but make the bear more angry as it quickly tackled and knocked Charles to the ground. 
The 700-pound bear pinned Charles to the ground and focused its attack on Charles' head and neck. It swiped its massive claws through Charles' flesh, while its powerful jaws carved grooves into his skull. The bear seemed to be targeting its attack on Charles' head, continuously biting and swiping at his scalp, removing significant portions of flesh in the process. It then bit into his neck, tearing flesh and crucial arteries from his body. Blood started to spray onto the bear and forest around him. Charles desperately raised his hands over his head and neck as a shield, but the bear clamped down on them and crushed them into useless lumps of bleeding flesh. Then the bear went in for the kill. It gripped Charles' head in its mouth and squeezed down in an attempt to crush his skull, but only managed to penetrate one of its canine teeth fully through his skull. Now, with a two-inch hole through Charles' skull, his hands mangled and his scalp torn to shreds, the bear stopped the attack and went back to the moose carcass just a few hundred feet away. Charles was now laying unconscious in a pool of his own blood, barely hanging onto life. He gained consciousness about 10 minutes later, and despite his condition, he was determined to get to an area to reach out for help. He tried crawling, but the pain was so overwhelming he was unable to move. Charles managed to prop himself in an upright position against a tree stump where he slowly searched his supplies with his only useful hand to find his cell phone to call for help. He dialed 911, and emergency responders were immediately dispatched. Charles remained on the phone with 911 for nearly an hour while he waited. He had to direct the officers to his location, somewhere deep in Yellowstone National Park. When they found him, he was still clutching his bear spray can in his functioning hand, despite it being completely emptied on the bear previously. He was stabilized to the best of their abilities at the scene and immediately transported to the Eastern Idaho Emergency Medical Center in Idaho Falls for life-saving emergency medical support. The next day, as Charles and the medical team fought for his life, Montana game wardens approached the area. They made a lot of noise and were very clear in their efforts to run the bear off so they could complete their investigation into the attack. However, the bear had other plans. As they approached the attack scene, it emerged from cover in the same threatening manner as it addressed Charles. The bear's head was low with its ears pinned back in a clear sign of aggression. The wardens fired off special rounds that crackle and pop in an attempt to persuade the bear to back off but it failed. As the bear powered toward the seven volunteers and their dog, it got bogged down in some thick brush, temporarily slowing its attack. The bear quickly regained its traction and continued its advance toward the group. The bear reached within 40 feet of the men before they discharged lethal rounds and dropped the bear. As its blood seeped into the soil, its rage and aggression dissipated as it stopped all movement. The wardens performed a necropsy on the bear's carcass and investigated the attack scene. On Charles' clothes, they had noted the contents of his bear spray can. As they examined the bear, the same was found on its fur, meaning that Charles had, in fact, discharged his bear spray successfully. Once the bear had been cut open and the contents of its guts analyzed, the wardens determined that the bear had been feeding on the moose it was defending. They also found tissue from at least one other grizzly bear, confirming that the grizzly bear was previously fighting off other bears in defense of its meal. This is the most likely reason the bear was so aggressive towards Charles and the wardens. Back at the medical center, Charles had two surgical procedures in an attempt to save him. According to doctors, the surgeries went well, but sadly, within a few days, Charles suffered a severe stroke and died from the trauma inflicted during the bear attack. West Yellowstone organized a memorial service at the Union Pacific Dining Lodge in town, and his family held their own private ceremony in commemoration of Charles. Two nights after Charles was mauled, the town of West Yellowstone had another bear visit them. The locals point out that the bears are so numerous that they can hardly avoid run-ins with them. The Greater Yellowstone area, which spans portions of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, is reported to have more than 700 grizzly bears. 
Fatal attacks have increased in recent decades as the bears recover from their threatened status. Humans have also begun moving into rural areas more than ever before. Since 2010, grizzlies have killed eight people. They are still under federal protection in areas outside of Alaska, although recent discussions have begged review of that status. More and more people fear that as long as the grizzlies remain protected, their numbers will continue to rise, increasing the chances of more innocent people meeting their unfortunate final affliction. Prospect Park Zoo in Brooklyn was once on the list for the top 10 worst zoos in America. The animals were kept in small cages or in pit-style enclosures. They were offered little stimulation or environmental enrichment, but provided entertainment for the thousands of visitors that had entered its gates since the 1930s. In May 1987, just as the zoo closed up for the day, three young boys walked around its perimeter. They were on a mission, a mischievous mission that was both exciting and adventurous, but it was also dangerous. They planned to sneak into the zoo and swim around the seal moat. It was a silly dare the 10 and 11-year-olds had come up with, though it would be one that would cost one of them his life. The security team began their patrol, and the night watchman on duty paced near the zoo's entrance. But the boys had found another way in. A small hole in the perimeter fencing was just big enough for the youngsters to crawl through. They knelt down, hardly daring to breathe as they tugged at the fencing a little. Then they pulled themselves through on their tummies and stepped inside. All was quiet. A few workers remained on site, but the hustle and bustle from the visiting public had died down now. The boys made their way to the seal enclosure, but on the way, they spotted something else. Another enclosure, the polar bear exhibit. This also had a moat around it, but this one was far more dangerous. It was far more exciting for the three young boys. They dared each other to climb in and swim around the polar bear's moat. It was the ultimate challenge. The night watchman and security team were on the lookout that night, as they were every night. They had driven past the polar bear enclosure at 5.15 that evening and again at 5.45. They were due back there two hours later as they patrolled the park. They were aware of break-ins during out of hours and often had to chase youngsters out of the park at night. So far, none had been stupid enough to breach any of the animal enclosure fences, but that was about to change. These three boys were up for the polar bear challenge and each agreed to it. They stripped their clothes off, removing their trousers and shoes, ready for their daring swim. All three of them were giggling with excitement. They couldn't see the polar bears at the time as they were in their cave, but they knew they were in there. They just needed to scale the wrought iron fence and drop down on the other side. Then they needed to swim around the moat before climbing back out. That was the plan. It would be an excellent story to tell their friends. To have swum in the polar bear enclosure was only for the bravest of boys. 11-year-old Juan picked up all their clothes and threw them into the enclosure. There was no going back now. He began to climb the metal fence. He pulled himself upwards, scraping his hands on the bars. At the top, he managed to climb up and over the outwards pointing sharp metal points. He teetered on the top of the fence, waiting for his friends to catch him up. One of them backed down and remained on the ground, but the other scaled the fence with Juan. They looked down into the enclosure below. It was surrounded on three sides by the moat, had eight-foot iron fences around it, and was backed by a twenty-foot cliff. The boy's clothes lay in a pile on the concrete. Juan dropped down, closely followed by his other friend. They were inside. They had made it. Now, the real challenge began. The dare was to swim in the moat. The two boys walked forwards whilst their friend watched on the other side of the bars. Juan stepped into the moat, but his friend decided against it. It was too dangerous. He headed back to the fence, while Juan proceeded through the water. He half waded, half swam across to the other side. The water was cold. A shudder ran down his spine. By now, the commotion the boys had created had alerted the enclosure's residents. 1,200-pound, 540-kilogram Teddy 
and 900-pound, 400-kilogram Lucy, the bears stirred from their den and came outside to investigate. They lifted their heads upwards and sniffed the air. Then they turned and looked at the boys. They had been at the zoo for more than 20 years, born in 1964 and transferred to the zoo the following year. That enclosure was all they had known. They had never encountered anyone else or anything else in their territory before, so this had come as a shock. How were they going to react in this new situation? Would their natural instincts kick in? By now, Juan had swum across the moat to the other side. He had climbed out, and when he stood up, dripping wet, he saw the enormous polar bears. The first bear did nothing. It just stood, staring at the boy. But the other polar bear reacted differently. Upon spotting the intruder, the male polar bear immediately clambered down a rocky outcrop towards the boy. It lumbered towards him with the characteristic gait of a polar bear, its head swinging slightly from side to side, its huge paws placed carefully in front of it with each step, an impressive beast, powerful and strong. Juan felt the adrenaline surging through his veins, his heart thumped loudly in his ears. He felt sheer terror as the enormous predator came closer and closer. He froze, visibly shaking where he stood. He didn't try to run. He didn't try to hide. Instead, the small 11-year-old froze to the spot as the polar bear lunged at him. It grabbed him in its jaws and shook him violently. His friends screamed as they watched on in horror. The boy's cries were heard by staff at the zoo. They knew something terrible must have happened. Children had been sneaking into the zoo recently, and the security guards were constantly patrolling the zoo at night. It was now 7 p.m., two hours since the zoo had closed, and the blood-curdling screams meant only one thing, that someone was in serious trouble. They followed the sound of the desperate cries and dialed 911. As their friend was being mauled to death, the other two boys made a run for it, two partially naked boys fleeing into the night. When the zoo staff arrived at the polar bear exhibit, they could see the male polar bear dragging Juan's body across the enclosure. The boy was limp and lifeless. Emergency services and armed officers arrived on scene. What they found was deeply disturbing. There, just outside the polar bear den, were the two polar bears. Both were growling and fighting over the remains of the boy, tussling over the body. Only his upper half was left and they pulled at it, each trying to keep it for themselves. It was a gruesome sight. There was no hope for the boy. It was clear to the officers that he was dead. They saw the pile of clothes scattered about on the ground and the blood on the polar bear's white fur. The scene they were faced with was deeply concerning. They suspected that there might be other children inside the enclosure. They found three pairs of trousers, a pair of trainers, and two unmatched shoes inside the compound. They thought more children might be hiding inside the cave, and so made the decision to shoot the bears. It took 20 blasts from 12-gauge shotguns firing rifled slugs and six bullets from a 38 caliber revolver to kill the bears. Finally, they fell to the ground, quiet and still. It was a sad end to their tragic lives. Protests broke out over the killing of the bears, and the zoo came under fire as it had done so many times before, for its lack of welfare towards the animals in its care. That very same evening, at 11 p.m., an autopsy was performed on the bears. Officers and zoo staff wanted to make sure that they had only killed one child and not any more. They didn't yet understand the whole story. When they cut the bears open, they found the remains of Juan and no one else. When the bears were dead, they scoured the enclosure to check for more bodies, just to make sure no more were found. Later, the parents of Juan's two friends called police to inform them what had happened. That's when the two boys were interviewed and were able to reveal the true horror of the story, a silly dare that went horribly, horribly wrong. Prospect Park Zoo was closed to the public a year later, in 1988. The cages and pit enclosures were completely demolished, along with most of the interior buildings. The zoo had long needed an overhaul. The conditions the animals had been kept in for more than 50 years were appalling. Empty beer cans and smashed wine bottles were strewn about some of the enclosures. 
The animals were injured by their inadequate housing. There were reports of staff mistreating and even killing some of the animals. And now, finally, something was being done about it. During the renovation works, the animals were rehoused across America. Then, five years and $37 million later, the newly named Prospect Park Wildlife Conservation Center reopened. It was the fresh start the zoo needed. The conditions the animals were kept in were greatly improved, and the center had a new focus, to educate young people about wildlife and its conservation. A positive ending to an otherwise horrible story. Juan and two polar bears meeting their preventable final affliction. Yellowstone National Park is not only home to a wide array of wildlife, but also bubbling hot springs, towering mountains, and crystal clear lakes. It boasts of over 500 geysers with the famous Old Faithful Geyser shooting a plume of steam in hot water high up to the sky. The park also boasts of over 200 hiking trails that usually burst with color as wildflowers bloom in the spring, creating a stunning display of natural beauty. It is a place of unparalleled beauty that every hiker dreams of setting foot in. And thus, it was no surprise that on the 28th of July, 1984, Swiss national Brigitte Friedenhagen, together with her brother and sister-in-law, headed to the park, expecting a fun-filled family outing. The trio was excited to be there. They spent the first two days camping and watching the geysers at the Norris Geyser Basin. However, Brigitte wanted to quench her thirst for seeing the famous Yellowstone Bears. And so on the second day, Ranger James Youngblood handed Brigitte her camping permit for Site 5B1 on the Broad Creek Trail in Pelican Valley. The ranger reminded her of how wild the bears of Yellowstone Park were and warned her against traveling alone on the trails or keeping food in her tent. That evening, the trio talked about their plans for the next day. They would hike six miles to the Astringent Creek Bridge, from where Brigitte would proceed alone to Campsite 5B1. After camping alone for one night, she would then hike to the Grand Canyon, where she would meet her brother and sister-in-law. The morning came, and the trio, sticking to their plan, made their way to Astringent Creek Bridge. Along the way, they saw a large placard warning of the untamed wilderness within the Yellowstone backcountry. At the junction of Astringent Creek and Broad Creek, Brigitte's brother and her sister-in-law gave her a quick hug and watched as she disappeared into the winding hiking trail. After months of saving every penny for the trip, there was Brigitte hiking alone. It was happening. She couldn't help but feel a sense of freedom and joy wash over her. She stood, taking in deep breaths of the crisp countryside air as the gusting wind whipped through her hair. The experience was exhilarating. She felt alive and free. Her responsibilities left in Switzerland. Yellowstone was now hers to conquer. Aware of high bear activity, she knew the key to avoiding a bear encounter was by creating lots of noise. She tied two bear bells on her backpack, which would create a tingling noise to scare away any bears on her trail route to camping site 5B1. The Pelican Valley offers a relatively lush plant growth of sages, forbs, and grass. It is the ultimate bear's paradise, and Brigitte was there to witness the bears in their untamed nature. Nothing could stop her now. She pressed on with a smile on her face and a spring in her step. A few hours into her hike, Brigitte was attracted to the sound of running water. She had arrived at White Lake. Here, she found Campsite 5W1, which was empty. She was only three and a half miles away from her designated campsite, 5B1 at Broad Creek, but her feet were burning from fatigue. The thought of venturing further alone in her exhausted state was unpleasant to her, so she made camp at White Lake Campsite 5W1. She made dinner as she watched the sun sink below the horizon. After dinner, she found two pine trees 85 feet from her campsite. She climbed up and strung a rope between the two and hung her food. She then changed into blue pajama pants, took out her journal and scribbled, I have taken all the precautions. Brigitte then got into her sleeping bag with her head near the door of the tent. She placed a flashlight on one of her sides and a cassette player on the other. The dark clouds gathering above Yellowstone finally gave in. 
The gentle pitter-patter of the rain on her green dome tent pulled her into a peaceful state. She curled up tighter in her sleeping bag for warmth. As the rain poured, she drifted further and further away, her dreams voyaging her on journeys far beyond the bounds of Yellowstone Park. Outside, the winds howled as lightning illuminated the darkness, casting brief shadows of the tree trunks. But she remained undisturbed, lost in the sweet embrace of her sleep. Brigitte didn't notice as a shadow emerged from the woods. A grizzly bear cautiously approached the tent, tasting the air as it lumbered closer. The smell of a possible meal drew it closer to the tent where the 24-year-old Brigitte was peacefully resting. It stood on its hind legs with its claws drawn and ready. With a single swipe, it tore down the tent from top to bottom on the right side of the door. The grizzly then stuck its head into the tent and with a single bite, grabbed Brigitte by her head, sticking its fangs into her face and skull. It pulled her out of the tent, crushing her jawbone in the process. She screamed in pain, trying to free herself as the bear dragged her away into the cold, dark night. At 3.30 p.m. the next day, Brigitte's brother and sister-in-law were waiting at their meeting point on the trail. They had known her to be time conscious, and so as the minutes passed by, they grew nervous. Soon, minutes turned to hours, and their feelings grew to fear. Something is not right, they thought to themselves. They hurriedly rushed to the Fishing Bridge Visitor Center, where they informed the ranger on duty that Brigida had not shown up. The ranger immediately issued a missing hiker alert in the park. At 8.15 p.m., the alert of a missing hiker finally got to the ranger manning Pelican Valley, who instantly embarked on a search mission. The ranger patrolled the valley, and by 11.30 p.m., his efforts were fruitless. Throughout the night, the rangers kept an eye on the hiking trails with hopes that Brigida would finally show up. The clocks were striking 7 in the morning, more than 12 hours after Brigida was reported missing, when Ranger Marshall was dispatched on a horseback to trace her. Marshall followed Brigida's hiking route, and at White Lake, he saw a green tent with a red sleeping bag outside the tent. To him, this was odd since Campsite 5W1 hadn't been booked recently. He immediately got off the back of his horse to investigate the site. He noticed a large tear on the right side of the tent's door. On peeking inside, he found her hiking gear intact. 85 feet from the tent was a bag hanging from two pine trees, just as Brigida had done two nights ago. The bag was ripped apart with its contents scattered on the ground. Not far from the campsite, Ranger Marshall found a human lip, muscle tissue, and hair with a scalp attached to it. He immediately radioed the other rangers of his findings and continued his search for Brigitte. Rangers Tim Blank and David Sprites arrived at Campsite 5W1 in a helicopter armed with loaded shotguns to aid in the search. The three followed a trail of Brigitte's body parts to the north of the campsite. At about 10 meters from the campsite, the trail of carnage led to a small patch of grass that had pieces of tattered blue clothing and lots of human tissue. It was here that the bear had stopped dragging Brigida by her head and began feeding on her. Due to the heavy downpour, the rangers had a rough time tracing the bear's steps, but after hours of tracking, they finally found Brigida's body 250 feet from her tent. The skin on her arms had been completely peeled off up to the shoulders, and her left foot was detached from her ankle. Her muscle flesh on arms, legs, buttocks, and upper torso had been completely mauled. That evening, Brigida Friedenhagen's remains were flown to her devastated brother and sister-in-law at the Fishing Bridge Valley. On August 3, 1984, the couple flew back to Switzerland with Brigida's ashes. What was supposed to be a fun family vacation had turned out to be the most grotesque bear attack in the history of Yellowstone National Park. To this day, the ferocious killer bear that ended the 24-year-old's life has never been caught and is still lurking around campsites in Yellowstone, waiting to bring more unsuspecting campers to their gruesome final affliction. Whether you think bears are cute, funny, or scary, it is generally agreed that they should be avoided. Usually, brown bears will only attack humans if they are scared or threatened. 
This alone should encourage people to leave the animal alone. However, if they choose not to, they are unlikely to survive the tail, as brown bears are 20 times more dangerous than their black subspecies. Knowing this, it makes our topic for today even scarier. We will be looking at one of the worst bear attacks ever recorded, which left seven people dead and three more injured in a terrifying rampage that lasted five days. The Usuri subspecies of brown bear is found on the northern Japanese island of Hokkaido, having been driven to extinction everywhere else in Japan. These bears are particularly feared in Japan as they are very large and well known to attack humans, having killed over 200 people in the last century alone. All of these attacks were usually isolated and only one or two people would die. However, one bear nicknamed Kasagake, meaning wind shadow, would change this forever. In the winter of 1915, in Sakabetsu, the animal was first spotted. Measuring at nearly 9 meters tall and 340 kilograms, this bear was a truly terrifying size. He had woken up early from hibernation and was now starving, so he approached a family farm. Although he scared the Aikida family that lived there, he was only interested in their corn that they were growing in the field, and when their horse started making noise due to its panic, the bear was scared off. A few days later, the bear came back. This time, the family wanted to make sure that it didn't return, and so the head of the family arranged for his second son, Kamataro, and two local hunters to be ready for when the bear came back. When he then reappeared for the third time ten days later, they shot at him several times, but Kasagake was only injured and retreated into the forest. The men tracked him into the forest, following the bloodstains that he left behind in the snow, but soon conditions became too treacherous and they had to give up their search. They came to the conclusion that he would not return as he had been taught to associate humans with pain and so would be too scared to return. They were wrong. On December 9th, 1915, Kazagake completed his first kill, the Ota family. That morning, the wife of the house, Abe Mayu, was inside, babysitting her friend's young baby, Hasumi Mikio, while her husband tended to the farm nearby. The pair were inside the house, unaware of the danger, and simply going about the morning routine of caring for a small child. At 10.30 a.m., the bear arrived at the home of the Ota family. He suddenly attacked the baby, killing him instantly with a savage bite to the head. Mayu was screaming, terrified for her own life, but also in horror of tiny Mikio's own demise. She hoped that her husband would hear her and save her from this massive animal and began throwing firewood to scare it away. She ran for the door, but Kazagake was blocking it and knocked her to the ground before dragging her out of the house and into the forest to finish her off. Unfortunately, no one came to save her, and she was killed by the bear. When her husband returned from the farm, he collapsed. The farmhouse was covered in pools of blood, and the body of Mikio was still in the middle of the room. He was devastated that his wife was gone. He had no hope of her survival against a bear no one had any hope against such an animal. The next day, 30 men entered the forest to hunt down the bear and recover what was left of Mayu's body. They didn't have to search for long. 150 meters into the forest, they saw a large, shadowy figure in front of them and knew it was the culprit. Five of the 30 men began shooting at the bear, but only one was able to hit him. Although this enraged the bear, it retreated into the forest and did not attack the men. Feeling accomplished, they continued with their journey into the forest and began following bloodstains that they found in the snow. This led them to the dismembered body of Abe Mayu. She had been mostly devoured by the animal, and so only her head and legs remained. It was a truly horrific sight to see. Her body had been partially buried in the snow, that it could be preserved for the bear to return to later on. Her husband took Mayu's remains back home with him. That evening, the bear returned to the Ota family home once again, but although the villagers shot at him once again, he escaped unhurt. After hearing about the attacks and hearing the shots within the forest, 
The women and children of the village had begun to panic. They all sought refuge at the house of Miyoki Iasutaro and gathered together while only one guardsman was stationed outside to protect them. That night, Miyoki Yasutaro's wife, Yayo, was preparing a meal with some of the other women while carrying her son, Umakichi, on her back. She heard rustling behind her, and before she even had time to turn, Kazagake smashed through the window, sending glass flying everywhere. As the cooking pot was pushed over, the fire was quenched and the oil lamps went off, plunging the house into darkness. All that could be heard was the screams of the women and children as they panicked running to find an exit in the dark. Yayo tried to escape but was tripped by one of her younger sons who was clinging to her leg in fear, begging her to save him. The bear proceeded to attack them both, clawing at them with his enormous paws. The house guard, Oda, was hidden behind some furniture, but while the bear attacked Yayo and her children, he was spotted. Kazagake quickly turned his attention to the man, and as he tried to flee through the front door, the bear quickly swiped him and scratched deep marks into his back as he fled. This interaction gave Yayo and her children enough time to escape, and they ran from the house, screaming for the other guardsmen to help them. Blood was now covering every corner of the house, as the screams of the injured and dying filled the air. Kazagake then attacked and killed two more young boys before turning his attention to Take Ishigoro, who was heavily pregnant at the time. She was cornered by the huge animal and knew she had no chance of escape. She pleaded with the animal to not hurt her unborn child or touch her belly and to only eat her head. She was quickly attacked, killed, and eaten by the bear, and although the fetus was found alive in her body, it soon died also. In two days, six people had now died at the hands or paws of Kazagake. The guards had now returned to the cottage, led by a very badly injured Yayo. Although it was dark, they could hear sounds of the attack from within the house, so it was proposed that they would simply burn the house down, as that would surely kill the man-eater. Yayo was convinced that the children inside were still alive and fought against the guards, forbidding it. The guards split into two groups and surrounded the hut, but the bear had already left the scene, leaving a path of death and destruction behind him. As the injured were taken to a safe house, Miyoki Yasutaro sought for a solution. He had lost two children and his wife was gravely hurt, so he was desperate to be rid of the bear that was terrorizing the town. He had heard of an expert bear hunter who was close by and went to find him. Yamamoto Hakichi is thought to have killed over 300 bears in his lifetime and was somewhat of a local legend. Unfortunately, when Yasutaro arrived, he found that Hakichi had given up his bear hunting days after his pregnant wife was murdered by a bear many years ago and had since become an alcoholic. He had been working to catch Kazagaki for many years as there had been a similar attack which had killed three women in the past, but once his wife was killed, he had given up on life itself. However, when he heard the full extent of the most recent attack and how helpless the villagers were, he finally agreed to join them and kill the bear once and for all. The next few days were spent with several different teams trying to find and kill the bear. He had ransacked the locals' food and damaged eight houses by now, and the situation was becoming desperate. The men even used the corpse of Mayu to attract the bear, which angered many members of the village as they believed the plan was disrespectful to the dead. Regional police had now heard about the attack and sent a sniper team to kill Kazagaki, but they couldn't find him either. Finally, five days after the first sighting of the bear, he was finally shot and killed by Yamamoto Hakichi, with one shot to the heart and another to the head. The rampage was over. Sadly, this event caused the destruction of the village. Although Yayo survived, her young son died years later of his injuries, and due to the horrific events that unfolded, people began to leave to find somewhere else to settle instead. Eventually, they all abandoned the area leaving it to the bears and the ghosts of the past. There is now a shrine to pray for the dead villagers called the Bear Harm Cenotaph, and the story of Kazagake has passed into legend.
a constant reminder of the man-eating bear and the innocent lives it brought to their unfortunate final affliction. 